Welcome back to the next webinar organized by Princeton University's Bentham Center for Finance. We we're happy to have Danny Rotek with us from the Harvard Kennedy School. Hi, Danny. And I uh, would like to give some introductory remarks first. And as usual, let me go back what we have seen so far and what we will go on further on. Last Friday, Michael Kramer was talking about vaccine development and it was a very interesting talk why we should develop 15 vaccines simultaneously and how we should streamline and incentivize the process of vaccine development as a cooperation between governments and private firms. Then I would also like to come back to Penny Goldberg's presentation on global value chains, which is connected to today's globalization debate, and perhaps we come back to this as well. On Friday, the Ron Asimoglu will talk, and then next week we have Jeremy Stein talking about the Fed policies, and then on Friday, Paul Krugman. So let me talk to today about globalization. I want to go and start with a bigger picture, and then uh, Danny will actually, you know, will talk the much, much bigger picture, but let me first uh, talk about the world order. There are two ways you can see the world order we live in. We can have a rule-based, institution-based world order, or a more outcome-based world order. The, the latter has the advantage that it is more flexibility. A large country can just push through its own interest more flexibly and react to circumstances. But the former, the rule-based uh, world order, has much more predictability, in, especially in a world where things become more and more complex. The rule-based order also has some limited reactions to shocks. So you can only react to a particular way. You can't just react in any way you would like to react. And is therefore a little bit more symmetric. So the outcome-based is less symmetric because a large country can push through certain interests on its own. Then the third difference is that you know, in a rule-based order, if there's an adverse feedback loop or a negative feedback loop, there might be trade wars or currency wars. The rules prevent such feedback loops. And this gives the whole system, if it's based on rules, a more stability, while an outcome-based world order is less stable because nobody controls these uh, feedback loops. Now, what are the institutions and the rules? The global institutions, you have the United Nations, WTO, IMF, World Bank, WHO, and so forth. And of course, you have a lot of regional blocks as well. Now, the world order, if it's rule-based, you might say it might be at a disadvantage for large countries, but it's not necessarily the case because the large countries can actually better push through certain rules, they can shape the rules, and they can also control the internal politics. So there might be some forces to push for national champions and other things, which might, you know, some favoritism at home. So having inter international rules might also discipline the behavior at home. So that's an advantage. But the big advantage is, of course, for large countries, they have more influence to shape the global rules. And that's also why we see more and more blocks developing. So countries form blocks together in order to have more influence and to shape the rules. Now, in terms of economics, what are the challenges of the economic order? So there are two challenges, of course. So what are the rules necessary to ensure the functioning of the system? And you know, what can you do such that the rules still reflect some national preferences and identity? So there's recent work by Grossman and Heltman, focusing very much on identity issues. And so that's still, and I think Danny will talk at length about this too. So different areas of the economic orders is intellectual property rights, patents, competition, health, uh, GMOs, uh, Chlorentine chicken comes to mind, and environmental and so social standards. And of course, also privacy rules. And the other big challenge is how to enforce all of these rules and who is enforcing it and is it credibly enforced. Now, in terms of geopolitics and economics, um, there's of course a balance of power and Larry Summers coined the famous phrase, balance of financial terror. Essentially, China is holding a lot of US treasuries and has therefore also some control over the um, um, influence of the US and vice versa. So there's a balance of power in this case. So if you have financial integration and if you have economic integration, you have some, you create some interdependency. You lose some autonomy, but you have some interdependency. You see this very clearly when Penny Goldberg was talking about global value chains. It's very, very important that, you know, there's some interdependence there. So the forces interact, of course, 
And there's also a convergence to common values. There's a pressure to create common human values that they will be you know, reflected uh, in, in this setting. And there will be a flow of ideas and of people. And uh, that makes uh, wars more costly. Once you have global value chains, it's much more difficult, much more costly to go start a conflict. And you have also, of course, common threats like the current COVID crisis, uh, coronavirus virus is a common threat. And this might be also sharpen your mind to stick together, but it might also be a divisive force. But you lose, of course, diversity. You lose, to some extent, the possibility to have regional experimentation, and you might lose some identity as well. That's, you know, Grossman and Hauptmann worked on identity, as I mentioned before. And uh, your resiliency uh, might depend very much whether you have a regional shock and then actually heavy integration helps because only one region might have a shock and the other region can help out or but if you have a symmetric global shock as we have now uh, the resiliency might be compromised you might feel too safe in this let me move on a little bit about the geopolitics and globalization and refer to some uh, work i did with uh, Rashtoshi and uh, harold james where we looked at this how great powers compete economically these days and what we did actually we compared germany imperial germany with the uk the rivalry which happened in the late 19th century with the rivalry which happens now between china and the united states and how do these great powers compete economically and you can see that uh, they're competing in a sense there's a, a one way to compete is with global infrastructure projects so your power projection uh, through the infrastructure projects and everybody's familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative, which is here the right picture. But you know, it's very, very similar to Berlin Baghdad Railway. And if you go to Istanbul, you see still uh, the train station of the big railway, which was planned for to run from Berlin all the way to Baghdad. So it just, the analogies are just striking between what happened in the late 19th century uh, Germany and uh, what China is doing now. You can also have a lot of what we call fighting with finance. So you have, you know, in the action, you use your financial industry to fund some projects or gain influence abroad. And most importantly, what I would like to focus on a little bit there now is this technology, technological standard setting. So you have essentially the ability to set the standards. If you look at when Europe was able to set the standards on the mobile phone standards on GSM, it got a competitive advantage. China tries to set the standard on the 5G network. And of course, the technological standard setting, I think, is way more important these days than looking at tariffs or other elements. And that's what uh, we outline there. I would like to spend two more slides on the technology side and uh, go from there. The question is a little bit, you know, do we want a flow of ideas? What's the optimal degree of openness of flow of ideas? On the one hand, if you have two open flow of ideas, you don't allow regional experimentation anymore. It's more complicated to try your own way. And you might limit natural monopolies as well. So and that's on the one hand. On the other hand, if you allow a lot of flow of ideas, you allow cross-pollination. So that's actually, you know, somebody develops an idea in one region, and you can also use it in the other region. And that's actually a good thing. In general, the size and speed matters. Having a large home market matters to a large degree. If you have a large home market, you can set the standards, especially for technology, and that gives you an edge. So smaller countries probably will associate themselves with larger countries in order to be part of a small, larger block in order to set uh, the standards, which then impact new, te new technological development and then gives you an edge in this new technology. Very important is also the privacy considerations. If you think about the 5G network, you know, there's uh, a big debate on these issues. And that's, you know, very important when we talk about globalization as well. Now, what's about borders and blocks? I would like to make the case that, you know, we have legal borders, we have countries and blocks of countries putting together, but technology or data largely ignores national borders and creates their own borders in form of networks. What's the border of Facebook? You know, there's no border. It has its own network. 
And that technology in general raises difficult issues in terms of globalization on competition side, on privacy or preferences more generally side. And you can actually use networks, uh, what's often referred to as weaponization of networks through surveillance, dependency, as you can use also currency uh, the weaponization of the dollar, as many people have talked about. So I would like to uh, finish my introductory remarks with a short poll question. Um, should we use the COVID crisis to rethink all of the globalization we went through in the last few decades and also trade? Or should we go back to the status pre-crisis? So we go back what we did before, but is this a nice opportune oppo uh, possibility uh, to really rethink the whole globalization, how the whole world order should look like? And I would like to get your opinion on that. And the second question is, Will a granular approach motivated by health considerations ultimately kill trade like it did in the 1930s? So should we allow for that? Or will it, it's a prediction question, will it kill it or not? Yes or no? So A is yes and B is no. And the third aspect is, um, will the implications for the emerging and developing economies countries, will it be detrimental as you know we have seen in the last few decades of course, China and other countries benefited enormously from technological transfer, as Penny Goldberg pointed out. And that's very bad. Should we you know, be sad about this or is it okay? So that's, is it very bad or is it okay in order to uh, eliminate inequalities within the advanced economies? And so I want to leave it with that and uh, ask questions and Perhaps we can answer these questions briefly and uh, then we can, uh, I can just summarize them. Can you see the, the results? So the questions were, should we use COVID crisis to rethink globalization and trade more generally? 86% think we should fundamentally rethink it or, and only 14% think we should go back what we had before. Okay, that's a very strong statement, uh, I think. And that we have to then fundamentally rethink and Danny will help us to start this thinking or he started it a long time ago. Second question is, will this granular approach, you know, we will drift because of these health considerations, uh, we will kill trade ultimately. And only 22% think that's the case and 78% think, no, that's not the case. Trade will be an important component in any new world order. And finally, the third question is, will the implications for the emerging economies, will it be detrimental because technological transfer will decline or will it be okay? And 62% think it will be detrimental and only 38% think it will be okay. So with this, uh, let me pause the floor to Danny and he will uh, give us his perspective. Thanks a lot, Danny. Can you share your screen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcus, um, very much for this. Um, you've you've um, really put together a, a fantastic uh, lineup of, of speakers um, and, and you're to be congratulated for that. I also love the way that you uh, begin each one of these with a mini lecture uh, of your own, um, which um, is, is always um, uh, interesting. Um, I should tell you that my great grandfather worked for the Berlin Baghdad uh, Airway uh, back in the in the Ottoman times. Um, oh wow! Okay. Uh, I, I do have a personal connection to some of the the earlier geopolitical uh, um, competitions that that um, that you discussed. Um, I'm going to be um, talking about uh, where we where we're headed with globalization. Um, and, and, uh, and, and talk about my own ideas about uh, where uh, we, we could be or should be uh, going. Um, first, um, with respect to the, the immediate impact of um, COVID-19, um, uh, everybody who's listening into this uh, knows that uh, the immediate impact on economic globalization um, has been very negative. Um, um, we can see that uh, in a very large uh, 
um, a reduction or in, in this case very large outflow um, of uh, uh, portfolio flows from the uh, emerging markets uh, in the uh, immediate aftermath of the of the, of the pandemic um, uh, much bigger outflow than than we we've, we've ever seen um, we also uh, see it uh, in uh, current projections on what's likely to happen um, to uh, the volume of world trade. Um, the WTO projects that uh, um, the volume of trade this year will decline from somewhere between 10 and 35 percent. Um, and that's, uh, again, uh, a, a, a very, very uh, large um, uh, reversal. Um, but as, as this uh, chart uh, actually shows, um, uh, the, there was already a process of what we might call deglobalization uh, from, uh, 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 that was going on uh, well before uh, the current pandemic, the current crisis, or in fact, well before um, uh, Trump uh, launched his uh, trade war uh, against China. Uh, this chart from the WTO uh, shows the, uh, the trend in the growth of um, uh, trade um, pre-2008 and since 2008. And, and you can see very clearly in this chart uh, that the trend growth rate uh, already um, was significantly uh, slower. Um, so uh, you know, the, the first um, point that I really want to make um, is that even though the, the, the effect of um, the pandemic on globalization uh, is, is certainly uh, negative, um, I, I think uh, this effect works mainly in the direction of uh, re reinforcing and retrenching uh, and entrenching some trends uh, that were uh, already in place and that we can already see uh, in, in, in the statistics. Uh, so again, returning to uh, world trade, since the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, there has been a significant uh, decline in the buoyancy of world trade. Uh, so this, uh, if you look at the, um, uh, these individual um, little diamonds here, uh, they are sort of the, the annual elasticities of world trade with respect to GDP. Um, and typically in the post-war period, these elasticities have always been significantly above one, uh, meaning that when world GDP uh, grew by 1%, uh, world trade, the volume of world trade grew by 1.5%, 1.6%. Uh, but this, these elasticities have significantly come down, have hovered around one, and in fact have fallen before uh, below one uh, very, very uh, recently. Um, we have to remember that one of the, the biggest driver of the post-1990 expansion of world trade was, of course, uh, China, uh, with its um, major expansion of exports and correspondingly imports. Uh, there has been really a dramatic uh, reduction uh, in the export orientation of uh, the Chinese economy. Um, this shows that the China's export to GDP ratio is fallen from somewhere around 36% to something like 20%. So that's like a 16 percentage point decline in the export to GDP ratio of China, uh, which reflects a number of different things, including China bringing back um, uh, supply chains uh, back home. Uh, but this major driver of trade globalization um, is significantly uh, slowed down. Uh, more specifically, uh, global value chains um, have also, the growth of global value chains um, have uh, begun to, to slow down as well. Um, perhaps the, the bit of this that, that surprised me the most when I was looking at the data is that even uh, growth in service exports um, uh, has been significantly slowing down because services uh, was the part of exports um, that um, um, have been expanding the most rapidly in recent years, but just last year, the growth of service exports was very, very in anemic. Um, and with respect to financial globalization, I, I think um, uh, I have not actually seen data like this for the last couple of years, but uh, um, the, the volume of cross-border capitals um, have actually also declined since the pre-financial crisis peak. Now, much of this is actually what's happening within the euro area. 
um, but but still, um, we're 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 below the uh, pre-financial crisis peak. So all of these are are suggesting that there is an ongoing process. Whether you look at um, trade as a whole, global value chains, uh, you look at at finance, uh, that there is an ongoing process of um, rather than calling it uh, deglobalization, I guess I would rather call it a process of a retreat from hyperglobalization. Um, is the term that I'll try to say a little bit more uh, in a couple of min minutes. Um, so if we take it as a given um, that uh, the COVID-19 crisis is simply going to uh, reinforce and, re and entrench the trend, how do we think about this? Um, the, the second main argument that I want to make in some ways, my main argument uh, is that a retreat from hyperglobalization uh, is not going to be necessarily bad uh, if we manage in the process uh, to construct a, a more sensible globalization, one that's based on uh, economically more sound principles uh, than, than the one uh, that we have had. This is by no means a foregone conclusion. We could easily um, end up um, going off the rails in a major way um, and, and so we don't know exactly. So what I'm going to be arguing for certainly is not a prognosis. If I were to make a prognosis, I would probably say that we're more likely to go wrong, at least in the short to medium term, than go right. But I want to suggest that there is a path forward uh, that does not entail trying to reestablish uh, the uh, hyperglobalist uh, order that we've tried to build since the 1990s. Um, that retreats in some ways, or I should say not retreats in some ways from that, but also rebuilds globalization on a more sustainable, uh, more inclusive uh, manner. So in, in, in the rest of my talk, what I want to do is, 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 is just um, try to diagnose a little bit um, uh, what went wrong with our hyper-globalist uh, model uh, that is now in, in retreat. I want to step back and say, okay, if we were going to, if we were to construct a sensible economic globalization. What kind of a norm, what kind of normative principles would we want to apply? So that's normative logic of global regimes, um, and that's going to lead me into discussion of what kind of globalization we should want. Um, and then, to the extent that there is time left, I want to apply those principles uh, to what is probably the most important uh, economic relationship of our uh, of our day in terms of you know. Having, playing a role in determining the future of economic globalization. That's the US-China economic relationship. And I want to say a little bit about how these broad normative principles can be uh, rendered concrete and be applied to the US-China uh, relationship. So that's, that's sort of the plan. Um, so uh, I titled this, this slide, Making uh, a Globalization, because I want to drive home the point uh, that globalization is not something that because of technology, because information and communication revolution is that it's something that's totally exogenous that just falls onto our laps uh, that we've had no control over. I think far from it, um, I think uh, economic, the par particular type of economic globalization we've had since the 1990s uh, is, is one that has been the result of conscious decisions, policy decisions uh, that have been made uh, by important actors uh, governments and, of course, uh, banks and firms uh, you know, um, making, um, pushing the government's uh, policy decisions in particular directions. So uh, we need to understand that globalization is not a kind of a self, necessarily a self-generated uh, regime, that a regime, a globalization runs on both rules, explicit rules, as well as on norms. So the policy, the policy decisions that we make here are key. Some of these uh, rules are explicit and they're written into legislation or agreements. So um, we have a bunch of you know, trade and investment agreements, everything from the WTO, the rules of the WTO, uh, to bilateral or multilateral or regional uh, trade and investment agreements. Uh, we have the extremely important set of banking laws and regulations within financial centers in New York City and London that sustain financial globalization. Uh, OECD membership requires rules that are sort of imposed or that are that 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 um, that 
uh, countries have to, um, uh, to, to adopt in order to join um, and remain members of the OECD. Of course, the European Union runs on now, I think it's nearly 200,000 pages of rules and regulations called the acquis communautaire. All of that sort of sustains a single uh, common single uh, market um, in, in, in Europe. So some of these are explicit, but I think others, and often much more important, are actually are the rules uh, that underpin uh, globalization uh, that are internalized through norms of good behavior. So for example, for the vast majority of uh, emerging markets and developing countries today, the norm of openness to capital flows is not necessarily one that is enforced uh, through international agreements. It's not something that the IMF or any in investment agreement makes those countries do. It's a norm that these policymakers in those countries themselves um, have, have, um, have internalized. Uh, similarly, I think many decisions that developed country policymakers make uh, with respect to whether to prioritize the international trade investment uh, regime or to prioritize domestic economic and social policy goals, those priorities are the result of certain norms about uh, you know, what good policymaking entails uh, and are not things that are simply enforced on Europe or the United States by the WTO. Um, so there, therefore, the question then then becomes: so, you know, where do these rules come come from? Uh, who writes those rules? Whose preferences, whose policy uh, preferences are privileged? And that's that's the whole point about making a globalization. That globalization regime gets to be determined by uh, these uh, explicit choices that are that are being made. So to make to drive the point home, sometimes I I, I make the, the following, um, which is I think it's it's. Uh, um, a comparison or thought experiment uh, that is uh, perhaps particularly germane today in the midst of a um, health crisis, um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, is to imagine that you know we had invested all our political capital and international diplomacy on building a kind of globalization that re that revolved around global public health and that had elevated the World Health Organization to a kind of organization that is as central to globalization as let's say the IMF, the OECD or the WTO uh, is today uh, to when we think about globalization. Alternatively, think about a globalization that revolves around a set of rules on in the environment or climate change where at the center we have international environment agreements. Um, you could env envisage a globalization where we're concerned about uh, social rights and, and, and the status of labor and labor rights where the ILO, um, a, an organization that is truly peripheral to everything that happens today in the world, played as a role as strong as the one that the IMF or the WTO does. Um, or you know, a, a globalization that um, privileges the economic over some of those other aspects that I've mentioned, health, environment, or, or our human and labor rights, uh, but uh, a, a, an economic globalization that privileges, let's say, the um, uh, priorities of developing countries. So that one would be perhaps centered around UNCTAD uh, rather than what we have today. Um, so, so we could have had um, a very many different types of globalization and, and we've picked only one. Um, even uh, within economic globalization. So, Danny, can Sorry. I interject here? Because there are some questions about the emerging economies and developing economies. Um, do you see, in terms of demographics, a difference too that you know the emerging economies have a lot of young people, young, young population, where the advanced economies and old population? That's one question. And what can small emerging economies do that if they don't want to rely on China or the United States? Is there anything on their own? And do you see a shift? For, from China towards India? Is India benefiting from, uh, you know, Chinese-US tensions? Marcus, perhaps we can, I can come back to those questions. Mm -hmm. after I've, I've gone through a little bit more of the argument because I think, you know, it'll be easier okay. for me to respond in the context of, of the, 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 um, the, the argument that, that I'm making. Okay. Um, uh, I want to um, uh, exemplify uh, the multiplicity of globalizations, even within the economic domain, uh, 
by talking about a little bit about the history of economic globalization and that we have had at least three different models of economic globalization uh, going back to the early gold standard. Um, so those three models are, are the gold standard, the Bretton Woods regime, and the post-1990 regime of what I called hyper-globalization. And I've, I've differentiated these uh, across um, five different uh, aspirational criteria, and I, but I could have added um, others as well. Um, the first ha three have to do with which type of markets uh, we are, um, we are um, uh, liberalizing. Are we, focus, are we liberalizing the flows of capital, the trade and goods, or labor mobility? And, and in those three respects, in fact, uh, these three uh, regimes were very different. Gold standard aspirationally uh, was open in all three uh, of those domains. Bretton Woods really only in terms of trade and goods. Uh, the post-1990 hyper-globalization added free capital mobility, but uh, stood, um, uh, uh, you know, did not uh, adopt labor mobility. Um, with respect to the last column, the question is whether the uh, policies and the norms, whether the regime is maintained um, with assistance from multilateral governance institutions. And the Bretton Woods and the post-1990 hyper-globalization did have central uh, role being played by governance multilateral governance institutions. The gold standard, by, uh, by contrast, was actually maintained through essentially norms uh, um, uh, uh, internalized by policymakers themselves. That, you know, there were certain rules that, that countries had to do, but this was not being enforced through, uh, you know, a, you know, a kind of any kind of, go, you know, global, um, uh, global um, uh, uh, multilateral institutions. Now, the one that, that, um, the one piece of the stable that I really um, think is is interesting because it's, it's the um, it's, it's the aspect of a global globalization of an economic globalization regime that becomes I think politically the most fragile um, and ultimately untenable um, is the this one on the fourth column uh, the question of whether the regime entails rules that significantly reach uh, behind borders. And that's the sense in which I think hyper-globalization relates to the gold standard. It's a very, very different regime when you look at in terms of the actual uh, mechanics or the actual policies. But there is one important principle that connects the gold standard to today's uh, hyper-globalization, which is that increasingly uh, we have developed international norms, international rules uh, that, um, that reach into domestic uh, economic and social arrangements. Uh, in the context of the gold standard, of course, that was very famously and explicitly in the context of how the rules of the gold standard constrained the conduct of what today we would call uh, monetary policy or macroeconomic policy. Um, and of course, that was the, the famous, um, you know, the, 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 you know, it was the, 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 the political, the source of the political fragility of the gold standard, the, 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 the extent to which uh, the rules uh, prevented individual countries from, uh, uh, from um, uh, uh, employing macroeconomic policies that, uh, that relaxed what today we would call austerity. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a famous, uh, of course, quote in the U in U.S. political history, uh, the uh, William Jennings Bryan, one of the leaders of the, the populists uh, back in the tail end of the 19th century, uh, uttering the, the famous statement that said, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, a very poignant statement uh, that you cannot let our domestic society uh, be essentially um, left hostage to the uh, to the requirements of this uh, global rules. And that was a very earlier meeting point between the globalization and the populist backlash, um, uh, driven by very much the same kind of, a, I think, conflict we have today uh, between the requirements of economic globalization and parts of society uh, fighting back, essentially saying we have our own needs and we want different kinds of policies and what uh, economic globalization requires. Okay, so if we want to sort of step back from this and, and think normatively about, you know, what kind of global rules we might require, the key design question here is going to be, um, you know, where do we have global rules and where do we let national autonomy be? 
So where do we have these, where do we put the, the dividing point between where every country can do whatever they want to do versus having global rules that's going to constrain what they can do? And that, that, uh, that decision immediately faces um, what I call the central trade-off of any globalization regime, which is that uh, common rules um, have the advantage of uh, maximizing uh, efficiency, predictability, reducing transactions costs, re reaping the benefits of scale and the gains from trade. Uh, that's the advantage we get from having a common set of rules. Uh, but they have the disadvantage of, because they constrain policy autonomy, uh, they constrain the ability of individual countries to design policies that might be more attuned to their needs. Uh, they also constrain uh, the ability to experiment at the national level, and that experimentation might actually be globally useful too, in the sense of being able to generate new policies, new ideas that might not have been in the context of a common set of rules. Um, so um, the question there, if there, if the question is, is how are we going to decide what is international and what is national? Where do we have global rules constrain national policy autonomy? You know, the first thing we might say or think is, well, where there are cross-border spillovers. When countries do things uh, that spill over the border to other countries, then we might want to constrain what countries do. Um, but that rule is, is way, too, um, uh, per, way too expensive in a way that that would actually rule out many things that we naturally think are actually um, uh, desirable for countries to have reasonable full policy autonomy. So just an illustrative list, you know, educational policies, you know, you know, we think that this should be in the domain of countries deciding what they do. But of course, standard trade theory will tell you that your educational policies will affect your comparative advantage and therefore will have affect uh, the, the uh, trade possibilities of your other, of other countries. So they certainly spill over. Um, the same for your R&D policies. You know, your highway speed limits would affect the demand for oil and it affects the world price of, of, uh, of oil and therefore obviously spills over. Um, you know, similarly with gasoline taxes. So these kinds of things that we, we naturally, you know, almost instinctively believe should be domains of, of national policy uh, would uh, be constrained uh, through international agreement uh, if we simply uh, apply the principle that whenever there are cross-border spillovers, we should try to negotiate some kind of an international regime. But sort of our instinct tells us that that can't possibly be right. Um, and I think that's right, that neither the presence nor I think the magnitude of cross-border spillovers um, are in fact a sufficient condition uh, for the creation of global rules, uh, even when they impose harm uh, on foreign countries, because there are very compelling uh, reasons, as in these specific policy domains for national diversity, uh, and because of the way that political accountability is still organized on the basis of nation states today. So the principle of spillovers, uh, cross-border spillover, actually does not help us very much. Um, I would like to suggest that there, there are, in fact, two canonical arguments uh, that create a rationale uh, for global rules. Um, and I'll call them uh, by their sort of technical names in economics. Uh, one is a beggar thy neighbor policies and the other are global public goods. Now, uh, I think it's useful to think of these in, in, their, in their sort of technical term in economics because, because they mean something very clear and because they mean something very clear, they help us demarcate, demarcate areas where there are very strong arguments uh, for global rules or global regimes and where the arguments are in fact are rather weaker. So it's important to understand what BTN and GPGs are. Uh, Beggar thy neighbor policies are policies that provide benefits at home only to the extent that they impose a cost on foreign countries. So it's not just a spillover, it's just that the home country derives a benefit directly as a consequence of the cost that is imposed on other countries. So the, 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 um, the um, uh, uh, archetypal example of this is the use of monopoly power in international markets. So some years back, uh, you know, China uh, restricted exports of rare earth uh, minerals 
uh, because it has near monopoly in these rare earth minerals, which are used in cell phones and other advanced technology areas. And quite clearly, the, the point was to raise world prices. Um, um, and, and that was a clear example of a beggar thy neighbor policy. Um, another example might be when there is generalized, under, generalized unemployment, uh, trying to export unemployment through currency manipulation. In fact, the term beggar thy neighbor uh, came into economic circulation when John Robinson in the 1930s uh, used it to, to refer to currency uh, depreciation policies on the part of um, uh, uh, individual countries, um, which was um, in, in this context. You know, I, I actually don't think in the gold standard context this was truly a currency, a, 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 a beggar thy neighbor policy, but, but that's, um, that was the origin. Another important area where I think there's a, there's a beggar thy neighbor is when countries establish tax havens not for the purpose of attracting physical foreign investment, but simply by shift to shift corporate uh, headquarters uh, to shift paper profits. And that's another example of a clear cut beggar thy neighbor. Um, now, global uh, public goods are, are areas where there is, you know, sort of um, essentially where there's very strong incentive to free ride on other nations' policies. Climate change is the classic case. We all share one climate. It doesn't matter where the greenhouse gases are emitted. Um, and purely from a, you know, a self interest standpoint, it wouldn't make sense for any individual country uh, to control greenhouse gas emissions uh, because these uh, emissions uh, essentially become, um, are, 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 are what matters is the collective, is the global uh, emissions. Um, from a, you know, much more germane to our current day, um, there are many elements of global public goods and, and public health. Uh, for example, vaccine development, uh, which I, I know um, Michael Kramer was talking about uh, last week, uh, is a clear area of a global public good. You know, once a vaccine is discovered, uh, then uh, essentially um, everybody can can uh, can 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 utilize it. Now, uh, so these are very clear-cut cases where you might make a normative argument for uh, moving um, for establishing uh, a, a global regimes. The point with respect to economics and economic globalization is that, in fact. Um, uh, in most areas of economics, um, it's very hard to think that either one of these two arguments apply, either the beggar thy neighbor or the global public good, that there is a very limited case for global rules uh, within most economic domains. And the reason for that, to use sort of very colloquial language, is that in most economic policy, virtue, that is, um, you know, virtue is its own reward. That is to say, most of the things we would like countries to do uh, that are actually good from a global standpoint are also things that are actually good for them to do for their own. Uh, that's what I mean by virtue being its own uh, reward. So, you know, for example, in terms of free trade, policies towards openness to trade, uh, that, you know, when we teach, you know, comparative advantage and the gains from trade, the argument for free trade is not that you should liberalize so that you provide benefits to other countries. Uh, the argument is that you should liberalize because it expands consumption possibilities for your own domestic economy. So it's good for you. And I think the same goes for a lot, so for most of the important areas of economic policy. So openness to foreign capital. Uh, if that's good to the extent that is actually good for your own economy. Um, pursuing policies of financial regulation and macroeconomic stability, the primary beneficiary, once again, is your domestic economy. Um, now, that is not to say that there aren't areas where, in fact, there are exceptions, but most of the important exceptions happen to be the ones I've already mentioned, uh, that, that under the heading of beggar thy neighbor, so monopoly power in world trade, currency mercantilism, or global tax havens are the three most important areas of beggar thy neighbor that I can think of. Um, now, this doesn't mean that countries actually don't make mistakes, that they don't, you know, employ policies uh, that are, you know, that, you know, they, you know, that financial regulation, macroeconomic stability, uh, policies towards capital flows or policies toward trade that are misguided from their own domestic standpoint. 
but it does, but, but there should be no presumption in general that when countries do things that are the wrong policies from their own domestic standpoint, uh, that international re rules can reliably, can reliably prevent uh, such mistakes. Um, and I think when we look at, at you know, often what international rules do, um, they're just as likely uh, to um, uh, uh, privilege one set of distributive interests in, within nation states over others uh, as they are to really target genuine areas of governance failure. Uh, so there could be an argument for delegation, for example, when there is domestic policy subject to time inconsistency or other types of policies where some international constraint, a trade agreement, uh, can prevent domestic policy failure. Um, but there are often as many other cases where, in fact, um, either, for example, that, you know, banks can, that are able to uh, dominate the agenda of um, capital rules in the context of BIS or multinationals or big pharma that are able to um, um, uh, 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 are able to shape the agenda of international trade negotiations. What is really being done is one set of domestic interests being uh, 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 privileged over others. Marcus, so I'm then, can I, I sort of see that you're trying to get in, so. Um, let me, uh, so if it's okay, uh, is it a good time now to ask some questions? Yep. I just want to get a sharper dividing line between beggar than neighbor and externalities. Do I see it correctly that if I want to do something because I have a certain preference and I cause some externality on somebody else, that's okay. But if I do something which gives me a financial benefit, that's a beggar than neighbor. Just is this the, the, the dividing line? Uh, uh, no, I think the, the dividing line is for you to, to think about whether it's something that you might want to do, regardless of the repercussions on other countries. So if yes. you want, um, so uh, if you're, if you're, let's say, you know, a, a major financial center, um, and you're really mis totally mismanaging your, um, your regulatory policies, um, you know, this would be just, you know, it's not a beggar thy neighbor policy because you're pursuing policies. These are, even if you, if, even if you're the only country in the world, you'll still be doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so that's, I think that's, that's the, that's the dividing line uh, between a beggar thy neighbor. Uh, beggar thy neighbor policies are, are going to be, um, yeah, I mean, typically, you know, negative sum. Um, uh, now, the problem with policies that are not beggar thy neighbor, uh, but are potentially damaging at home, uh, is that a, a third party observer cannot necessarily always judge whether that policy was inappropriate or not from the perspective of the home country. Because after all, that home country has decided this policy. A good example of this is European agricultural subsidies, okay? Mm -hmm. European agricultural subsidies are actually are, are not beggar thy neighbor. They're enriched our neighbor because uh, you know they you know to the extent that Europe is a is an exporter of these subsidized agricultural products, it's providing a net benefit to the rest of the world. Uh, but some but, people argue it destroys the agriculture development in the in the in the emerging economies to some extent. It, it could be a harm to some specific groups, but that is no different than if you are liberalizing your own trade and therefore you become a much more, much better competitor vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, um, let's say, so you liberalize your trade, your exports go up by learner symmetry. Um, and therefore countries that have a similar comparative advantage to you will now suffer a terms of trade loss, right? So now you have made some producers and the rest of the world worse off by your own liberalization but we, we would never say that you should not liberalize your home just because there are some segment of the rest of the world that has become worse off. So I think the same logic applies to agricultural subsidies is that, you know, in aggregate, the rest of the world is, is, better, is better off. There might be some that are worse off. The question is whether the rest of the world has any claim to tell Europe that you're pursuing the wrong policy uh, when, Europe, through its own democratic, you know, decision-making mechanisms, have arrived at, you know, a, a policy that most of us economists think are crazy, 
but you know that, that it's their own, but they're harming their own consumers and taxpayers. If that is the wrong thing, they're mostly harming their own consumers and taxpayers in the first place. Um, so I think in the case of a, a policy like agriculture subsidy, there's a very weak argument for a, you know, a, a global restriction on Europe's ability to harm itself uh, because mm -hmm. they might be compensating social or, or other arguments for why there is an economically costly policy being pursued. Um, and, um, and, and, and we should let European governments in their, you know, with their democratic accountability decide that. Um, when there's a bigger thy neighbor, you can sort of, you know, genuinely turn to that government and say, look, but the only benefit you could potentially be getting from this policy is through the harm you're imposing on us. And that's, uh, that's the claim why it would, uh, in a way, why the claim for a global rule makes, I think, normative sense. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to try to make this a little bit more concrete uh, by, by saying that if you, if you take um, these building, normative building blocks um, seriously, then, uh, you know, you, then, then the dividing line between what's global and what's national um, essentially um, should be determined by your answers to these three questions. Um, so you want you say kind of globalization that number one uh, has the potential uh, to produce uh, overall benefits. Um, and the larger the aggregate gains from trade, the greater the possibilities of domestic redistribution that are compensating those who might lose. So number one is you want to focus on areas where the gains from trade are very large. So for example, that might suggest that when the world trade regime is already very open, when the world financial capital flows regime are very open, uh, the net gains are actually very small. The potential for compensating the losers are rather small. Um, but like in labor mobility, where the gains, where the gains from trade are huge because the barriers are so high, uh, that in fact might be a, will be a priority relative to working on improving, uh, reducing transactions costs with respect to trade and goods and, and financial services. Now, the second principle is, is, uh, is precisely um, follows up on what I've been discussing, which is that there's a very strong argument uh, to focus on areas where there are bigger than neighbor uh, and global public goods. Um, but third, otherwise, would actually leave space for, for policy autonomy and institutional diversity. So in other areas, uh, you'd essentially leave countries to do uh, to pursue their own policies. And I think my claim would be in terms of the big answer, if you know, it's finally getting sort of, is the, the where did we go wrong after the 1990s? I think from, from the perspective of these desiderata, I think our priorities since 1990s have been significantly off. If you look at sort of where we have focused, that's, um, uh, that, that, that's, that's um, clear from, from what I've said. Um, so Can you give us some examples here, like the chlorine chicken or GMO? Would you say that? Well, the GMO is another example where I would say it's not a beggar thy neighbor. So the GMO, um, European um, limits on GMO, um, you know, again, Europe would have these restrictions regardless of uh, whether it was, you know, there were other countries in the world. They've, you know, they've decided to apply a principle um, that is way too, you know, from most, per, you know, sort of scientists' perspective, are too restrictive because we don't have any uh, evidence that GMOs might be harmful. A very restrictive precautionary principle says that uh, that we should still have, you know, Europe. That's what the Europeans have decided. Uh, if there's a harm that's involved, it's mostly to their own consumers, um, and and therefore I would say it's, it's not um, uh, it's not you know, for the rest of the world to tell the Europeans that, you know, they should not be hurting themselves to the extent that they are. The same would apply to European restrictions on hormone-fed beef, for example. It's a very similar uh, kind of kind of area. Um, what, what's about patent protection? How does this fit in? in well, that's scheme? another case where um, the, uh, I think the bulk of those issues have to do with countries choosing um, policy regimes uh, that might differ from the advanced countries because they believe that they're at a level of development uh, where the balance of costs and, 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 and benefits uh, suggest a much more lax 
um, intellectual property rights regime, you know, to the extent that they lose out on foreign investment because they have weaker intellectual property re regimes, once again, it's the loss is domestic. Um, but yet, you know, we have essentially in converted that in the trade vernacular into a kind of a more realistic, you know, stealing intellectual property rights or a beggar thy neighbor kind of an issue when it's not, when in fact it's not. So intellectual property rights is an area where I would, uh, I would um, uh, give, I would leave countries a very wide degree of latitude um, to, to uh, and, and that in fact, I don't think really belongs in, inter, in international trade rules. Um, so I think, you know, in, in, international, in, in the international economic are, arena where I think, um, uh, you know, where we could have done more are things like local tax havens, uh, because these are, many of them uh, are take the beggar thy neighbor um, I, um, um, uh, uh, color. Uh, we could have done more, although it's politically difficult, but, you know, you, if you can be precise in, in the area of labor, um, uh, uh, be precisely because the possibility of domestic compensation is much bigger, uh, given the magnitude of the gains from trade there. Uh, that possibly is an area where we might have done. So there are some areas we could have tried to push globalization further. Um, there are some areas where I think um, we've gone uh, uh, too far in, in, the, in the wrong direction. I think the main area of global public goods are, are again, sort of global uh, public health, health pandemics, uh, in, you know, climate change. Those are really the big, possibly international human rights where the you know, global norm of human rights. Uh, those are areas, largely non-economic areas where we could have invested a, a lot more by this, by, from this normative, normative criteria. So maybe, uh, you know, for five minutes, um, how am I doing? Do I have five more minutes? Yes, yes, we can go a little bit longer. Okay, um, just take, uh, you know, these ideas and, and, and try to apply them more concretely, for example, or think about how they might be implied, applied uh, to the logic of uh, the US-China uh, economic uh, conflict. Um, just recently, a few months ago, um, uh, uh, we convened a group of uh, economists and, and legal scholars from the United States and China. The group was uh, co-led uh, by uh, Jeff Lehman, uh, Yang Yao, and myself, um, and I've managed to uh, misspell my name, which is, uh, which is quite good. Um, and then we, we, we put together a, 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 a report, which was called U.S.-China Trade Relations, A Way Forward. Uh, this was from October, um, and, and we had actually a fairly um, good uh, uh, and high level sort of, you know, list of signatories, including five uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners in, in economics um, who, who signed on to this. Um, and the idea was that we wanted to, I think right now, as everybody knows, the discussion on China is essentially is uh, vacillates between uh, two, um, uh, two point positions which I think neither are tenable. Uh, one of them is sort of going back to this, you know, deep integration agenda, the, the hyper-globalization agenda. And I think membership of China in the WTO uh, was um, essentially implicitly presumed that China was going to become just another member of the WTO with you know, kind of a, an economic regime that would increasingly converge to that sort of a Western idea of a market economy. Now it's been it's become clear that that's not where the Chinese economy is going, um, and now there's increasingly another position, uh, especially in Washington, uh, which is called sort of the, the decoupling position, uh, which is essentially a, a much more dramatic decoupling of uh, the economies of U.S. and China, uh, because the China is an economy that's um, uh, run on, so, on obviously so, you know slightly different principles. Now that the decoupling position has a lot of political geopolitical um, uh, layerings as, as well, uh, but but what we want to do is 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 uh, come up with with um, a, a position that is somewhere in between those, uh, a position that can uh, preserve the bulk of the gains from trade while also allowing the two countries sort of reasonable amounts of policy autonomy. That would mean in some ways pushing back from the idea uh, that by signing on to the WTO, uh, 
uh, China had essentially accepted to run its own economy in a particular way, and also pushing back from the notion that the United States had to leave its market open to Chinese uh, exports and Chinese investment, no matter what that did to China, to U.S. labor markets or to the innovation system or the integrity of technologies uh, in the United States. Okay? Uh, so we want to do what we is, is prioritize policy space for both countries, um, uh, allow uh, these two countries considerable latitude at home to design a wide variety of, of, of industrial policies in China or innovation systems and social standards, labor market policies, um, but also draw very clear red lines around policies that might be, you know, beggar thy neighbor policies. Okay. So um, for that purposes, um, the approach that, that uh, we came up with essentially has four buckets. So the idea would be that China, the Chinese and uh, U.S. negotiators would carry out their discussions around sort of, you know, the, around these four buckets and try to put their policy disagreements in different domains, try to put them into one of these four different buckets. Uh, so the bucket, bucket one is one where there is, is clearly countries would be prohibited from engaging in some acts, such actions, and those would be very specifically these beggar thy neighbor policies. So if one country imposes restrictions on trade with the express purpose of reaping monopoly pricing gains on world markets, or you know, engages in discriminatory data policies uh, that promote uh, predatory pricing or rent extraction from uh, other countries' uh, firms. Uh, so those are clear examples of beggar thy neighbor policies in this domain. Um, if the policy is not a beggar thy neighbor policy, then this, the second step in some ways is to see whether it might fit into bucket two, which is the bucket where there are spillovers and externalities, and potentially there might be ways of reaching an agreement if the cost of this spillover externality to one country is much bigger than the gain that the uh, orig origin country is reaping. So you might be able to figure out some way of compensation, some way of, of, of reigning in what one country is doing uh, by providing maybe benefit somewhere else. What I think is, is the critical part uh, of this approach is, is the third bucket, which is uh, called the domestic adjustment bucket, is where uh, this is not a beggar thy neighbor policy and you cannot reach a mutual agreement. So neither bucket one nor bucket two works. Uh, so a mutually beneficial bargain cannot be negotiated. In this case, uh, then essentially, uh, the country that has a policy that provides a negative spillovers can keep its policies. And country B is then allowed to undertake what we call sort of well cal calibrated domestic policy adjustments with the demonstrable aim of reducing uh, the harm that those country A's policies impose on its own domestic economy. Okay? The key, however, uh, is that the remedy that country B would uh, employ to protect its own economy must be proportionate and well targeted at the domestic ob objective. So it's not actually using a threat uh, against country A to get country A to change its policies, or it's not trying to raise the stakes in a kind of a trade war. So it's purely trying to protect its own uh, economic policies or social arrangements rather than trying to get uh, to change uh, um, uh, the other country's policies. So I think this would be, you know, sort of in principle, of course, the question is the big, if such principles were adopted, uh, the big discussion would be whether policies belong in which, in which one of these buckets the policies would belong in. Uh, but I think this provides a kind of a useful language for organizing our thinking uh, about, you know, where um, uh, uh, things, where some certain policies are should be subject to uh, international surveillance, others uh, less so, what kind of bargains different countries can strike. And I think the way that we thought about this is the principles could apply uh, multilaterally as well. There's no reason why you can't apply these same principles in a, in a multilaterally, uh, but obviously the US-China relationship is in some sense the most fractious uh, and, and, and the most contentious one. Uh, in some sense, it provides um, uh, the, the biggest test uh, to these kinds of ideas. So let me just uh, uh, stop here um, and, uh, and and see if um, there are some... Yeah, so 
thanks a lot, Danny. It was really a nice uh, presentation and a nice way to think about uh, globalization. I want to interject the question by Gene Grossman put forward a question. Let me just read it to you. Why isn't cooperation always better than non-cooperation, regardless where the property rights lie? And don't we want countries to take into account the spillovers on others, even if the country has some moral or legal right to behave as it wishes? So I think you have a very practical, the buckets approach, uh, but what's about if you, you know, come with a more cooperative spirit to it? Uh, yeah, thanks, Gene. Um, you know, Gene, by the way, is, is a signatory to, um, yes. I, I hope uh, <laughs> his name is included here. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, so he's, an, he's a signatory. And I think what you're talking about, uh, Gene, uh, in, in, the, in the context of um, like the US-China trade would be uh, essentially bucket two. Uh, so you would, you would think that in a lot of areas um, where um, if it is very, you know, that, that you know, in this, in this strictly a kind of an externality, and the reason I don't use the externality is because I use the term spillover, it's a broader thing. If it's strictly an externality, it's the, it is the case, of course, then, you know, regardless of, you know, where you allocate the property rights, and there's always a kind of a, you know, mutual, should be mutually acceptable bargain that, that you can work out. Um, but, you know, but in first, a lot of these issues aren't strictly speaking externalities, and I think, you know, and, and then, um, and then sort of many of these um, areas, such as the use of you know, industrial policy uh, by China or um, the use of certain restrictive technology policies in the case of the United States, it's going to be as a practical matter, it's going to be very difficult for one country to agree to essentially, you know, uh, um, Compensate uh, the externality or the 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 spillover producing countries to not employ these policies through you know um, you know either through transfers or uh, by you know you know by finding um, other policies on which it can it can provide a compensate a, some kind of compensating benefit to the trade partner. But the point of bucket two is is. If you can reach such and such uh, an arrangement, by all means do so. So always cooperate. And there's always one area where cooperation, I think, always dominates is you can you can always talk because I think talking in terms of explaining to your partners why you're pursuing some policies that's always helpful. So you can actually find out what the preferences of your trade partners are. So cooperation in terms of talking, information exchange, and finding why different countries are pursuing different policies. That always is helpful. The question becomes, once you have that information and, and you know, you know, to the extent that you can, why certain countries are, are pursuing policies that are different, they don't fall into a strictly as better thy neighbor category. Uh, is it still going to be possible uh, to work out an, an arrangement along the lines of bucket two? And um, uh, I think, you know, the, the evidence is that often no, um, but you know to the extent that you know that is possible, obviously it's going to be better. I just wanted to know who decides which bucket are we in because it affects the bargaining power then dramatically. Is there a higher organization to decide, or we this is a bigger than ever violation, or is not, or so as in as in everything international. So this is an area where you need to develop the norms as an, as sort of, you know, you don't presume that, you know, parties come to the bargaining table with full trust and full shared norms, but you hope that if you have a reasonable way of moving forward, that those, that trust and shared norms can develop over time. So the question for the starting point is, are there a set of principles uh, which both sides can agree on as a way of talking? And I think part of the, um, appeal of using a term like beggar thy neighbor, which is a precise technical concept, is that it also disciplines the parties from not abusing it. So if one of the parties explicitly employs a beggar thy neighbor policy, but then says in the negotiations, it's not a beggar thy neighbor policy, then there is a certain amount of opprobrium that would have, you know, sort of, you know, would attach to it on the part of third parties, observers, economists, 
you know, sort of, so there, there are some limits to how much you can stretch the rules, uh, but ultimately it has to be, so this, is, this has got to be self-enforcing. Um, and the only way it can be self-enforcing, as in everything in trade, is that you, know, you develop these sort of shared, shared norms over time and you build the trust over time because it's in the interest of both parties. Thanks a lot, uh, Danny. Just uh, perhaps we can conclude with some questions which uh, came, which was primarily about populism and nationalism. Do you think that reaching behind the borders was a major contributor to you know, this nationalism and populism movement, yellow vests and, and other aspects? Um, and using the your bucket approach would actually prevent this or would have you know, slowed down the nationalism movement. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that we now have, uh, since it's, 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 it's work that um, David Otter, David Dorn, and, and Gordon Hansen started, and now we have very similar papers also from Europe as well, that shows that, that this uh, period of, of uh, significant um, uh, export expansion from China, the Chinese export boom, um, is... Um, is at least partly responsible uh, for support for um, right-wing authoritarian and right-wing populist um, movements, whether it's sort of Trump in, uh, in, in, in uh, the United States, the Brexit vote in, in uh, the UK, or support for um, uh, uh, right-wing nationalist populist movements in, in, in continental Europe. Um, and so this is interesting because um, um, you know, it could have been avoided uh, if, you know, the governments had taken a kind of a, you know, perhaps, you know, either, you know, slow down uh, somewhat, uh, uh, providing access to, uh, to Chinese exports into the U.S. market or the European markets, um, or they had engaged in certain much more extensive sort of safeguard action. It's useful to, to, and yet they didn't, because the idea was that, well, we're in this area where, you know, you better adjust to the trade. You know, trade is such a good thing that even if your local labor markets and certain regions are being ravaged, um, uh, you, know, you know, you just don't do anything. You know, free trade is such a, such a you know, amazing good thing that, you know, it's, it's more important. Um, and that's a, a kind of a, a, you know, this was a norm that developed after the 1990s that didn't necessarily exist. You go back one decade earlier to the 1980s, and you had a president of the United States, Reagan, right, uh, a conservative Republican. Um, and then it was really Japan that was really the export uh, superhouse. And, yeah, and, and in the 1980s, uh, we had a very different approach because, you know, we, you know people... Reagan started with all these trade restrictions, voluntary export restrictions on uh, exports from uh, Japan um, in steel, in cars, also the Europeans. Uh, so there was a very ad hoc uh, series of trade restrictions that were imposed by a conservative Republican president in the United States to limit uh, the impact of trade on labor markets and social, social bargains uh, in the United States. You go back, you know, a decade before then, you have the multi-fiber arrangement, which again, when the developing countries started to export clothing and garments in a very big way, those countries, the European countries, essentially worked out, US and European countries worked out this bargain with developing country exporters that would limit uh, this export boom and probably also provide quarter rents in compensation to the exporting countries. Uh, but it was a very different set of norms that, you know, you, you don't, I mean, people, you know, economists talked about new protectionism and so forth in the 70s and 80s, but that kind of protectionism actually saved the system uh, because, you know, it did not, you know, sort of disrupt um, uh, labor markets to the same extent that the Chinese uh, uh, export push did. In the 1990s, you never did, you don't, you didn't do that anymore. In fact, you know, the WTO made VERs explicitly illegal and, and so forth. Um, so I think, you know, this, what I talked at the beginning of my talk about sort of norms about what you do and what you privileged, uh, I think, you know, 
you know, this is, this is a very different type of globalization after the 1990s, that it became no longer uh, feasible to engage in these ad hoc arrangements, which were economically inefficient, but from a social and political standpoint, may not actually have made sense. Thanks a lot, Danny. We ran over today quite a bit, and I hope it's okay with your further commitments, but it was a fascinating talk. Uh, we're very happy to have you had you on this webinar series, and um, we're looking forward to your further thoughts on this, given that you know 86% think we should rethink the global trade system, and I think you will be a major player and a, a thinker in this space. So thanks again, and I hope to see everybody on Friday when Daron Asimoglu is talking, the same time, Friday, 12.30 US Eastern Time, or 6.30 p.m. in European time. Thanks to everybody and uh, see you on Friday. Bye-bye. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Marcus.